Now, concerns have been growing over China's role in covering up the extent of this pandemic and the US is demanding an investigation uh, into the origins of COVID-19. Let's just have a, a look at what Trump had to say on that. Well, if they were knowingly responsible, certainly, if they did, if it was a mistake, a mistake is a mistake. But if they were knowingly responsible, yeah, then there should be consequences. Uh, you're talking about, you know, potentially lives like nobody's seen since 1917. Matt, how, how concerned are you by how China's behaved through this whole cover-up? And would it surprise you uh, if their story, you know, their claims that it was uh, released into the world through the wet market uh, isn't true and that it, it might have been released through a laboratory? Well, this virus has had a devastating impact on the international community, not only in terms of the health outcomes, but also on the international economy. And it's going to take years for the international economy to recover. And at this stage, what we want from the Chinese government is a bit of transparency and openness so that we can get to the bottom of the origin of this virus, that we can come up with a workable vaccine and, more importantly, make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again and do the devastating damage that it's done. So the foreign minister's called for an international investigation. Uh, that's something that I back. Uh, I think and I hope that the foreign minister now goes about persuading other international players and countries to join in that chorus of calls for China to be more open and transparent so that we can get to the bottom of what's really happened here. Jason, does it worry you that this pandemic has shown uh, some of the more hostile nations around the world, you know, just what um, could be capable when it comes to biological warfare? Uh, look, I wouldn't go that far, Shari. Um, firstly, though, I have to compliment Matt on the art on his wall. That uh, the red hands are fantastic, um, but the um, they're my twin daughters' uh, red hands. Well, I, I, mate, I knew they weren't you. I knew they, they <laughs> it was a skill set above yours. <laughs> That's right. Um, but the um, and I can retaliate with some of my own art, by the way, from my own daughter. Um, but in the, the um, there, mate. <laughs> yes. Um, but, Shari, what I would say is that I think this demonstrates the failure of some of our multilateral organisations that are set up to monitor these things. The, th the thing that I've been most concerned about um, with the World Health Organisation has been some of the statements that they've made throughout this process. Um, for example, when they welcomed the reopening of the wet markets by the Chinese, that was something that I thought was incredibly dangerous and silly for an organisation of that nature to be saying. Um, the World Health Organisation has been critical of Western democracies while at the same time praising the Chinese government uh, for, what they've, uh, for what they did and the actions that they took. Um, I think the real problem here is, as Matt said, without the truth, uh, there is nothing stopping from this happening again. Um, so unless we have multilateral organisations like WHO operating properly, we don't, this could happen again. And, you know, the lives lost, the trillions lost, um, all of this has been, uh, could have been avoided if we'd had a more timely response, and that would have happened if we'd had more accurate information coming out of China at the time that this happened. But as Trump says, maybe it was an accident, um, but if it was deliberate, then that obviously has different consequences. Yeah, well, I think it's even in, even if it was an accidental release from a laboratory, not a deliberate one, you know, we still need to know that. I don't have as much confidence in the World Health Organization as you do. Um, no, but, I don't. But, no. Matt, I want to move to this COVID trace, this, this tracking app that the government wants 40% of the population to download this week. Uh, in Singapore, a similar app was only downloaded by 20% of the population. And, you know, that's a state where they're... That's a place where they're used to following the rules, unlike Australia. Um, in terms of the privacy and the safety of it, you know, Australians would be right to question whether they can trust the government to delete this data when they say they will. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Australians uh, can and uh, are justified in asking you know, questions about how this information is going to be used, um, how it's going to be stored um, and whether or not it will be uh, destroyed and deleted at the end of this so that it can't be used or sold on to other organisations in the future. They're legitimate questions. And we've been asking the government to provide as much information and comfort as possible to Australians. But we are in a unique situation. This is something that the world has never been in before, Shari, and it's going to require sacrifices from all of us. And as long as the government can get 
the privacy settings right um, and assure the nation that the information will be used for proper purposes, then I think that we all should be looking at downloading this app and providing the necessary data to make sure that we can stop the spread of the virus and ultimately do it. And I've got to say, I think it was disappointing that the likes of Barnaby Joyce and Lou O'Brien have said straight out that they're not going to be involved because uh, the Prime Minister's said from the beginning that one of the things that's going to get us through this is that we're all in this together. Um, and how can we be all in this together if some of the government MPs won't download and participate in this important data gathering exercise. Yeah, well, it's not just this exercise. They're often not in it together with the government. Um, but, <laughs> but, Jason, I actually understand their concerns on this, and I, I think it's really worrying when a Liberal government is asking to track the movements of its citizens. Uh, so, Shari, I think um, there's a lot of communication for us to do between now and the release of the app in a couple of weeks. Um, it won't be tracking people's... Um, movements. What it will be doing is obviously uh, tracking what phones you come in contact with. So what that means is if someone gets diagnosed with COVID-19, it will be able to go back and say to anyone who's been in contact with that particular phone, you have been in contact with someone who's now been diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, in the last 14 days and you should go and get yourself tested to make sure that you don't have that. I think Matt is um, right, and I think you're absolutely right. We need to give people ironclad assurances that the data will be deleted at the end of this process. I know that Stuart Robert has said that the code will be released so that people can get some level of comfort around what the app does. Um, and I think that one of the reasons that not as many people in Singapore downloaded it as we're hoping will in Australia, is that in Australia it, it's the grand bargain. So we can start to release, uh, we can start to, um, you know, uh, release some of these restrictions that we have. People can start to get back to work. We can have normal amounts of movement again um, if more than 40% of people download this app. If they don't, then we will have to continue with some of the social isolation procedures and protocols that we have in place. That's the trade off that we have. But once again, you're absolutely right. We need to make sure that at the end of it, the data is gone. Um, but people like Barnaby um, are wrong when they say that this would allow the government to trace where you've been. It won't enable the government to do that. And I understand the confusion. It's using Bluetooth well, or GPS. Yeah, well, if you're carrying your mobile phone, it is still tracking your movement. It's tracking your phone. It's tracking you. So I think it's semantics there. But, but lastly, um, New Zealand has... Uh, take, has asked its politicians to take a, a pay cut. Jacinda Ardern has. Um, would both of you take a pay cut in solidarity with uh, the millions of workers who are out of jobs and, and doing it tough and, and for the sake of our budget position? Matt? Well, Shay, I want to point out to everyone that um, politicians are, of course, still working. Uh, in fact, our offices are very busy at the moment dealing with the myriad of Centrelink issues that many Australians are having. I'm not aware of any proposal from the government to cut politicians' pay at the moment. Our, our pays have been frozen, I understand, and that's a, a good decision to make. Uh, but if the government were to come up with a proposal, sure, I'd do my bit. Uh, I'd certainly do my bit to make sure that I contribute to getting this nation through this difficult time. Jason? Um, the answer to your question, in short, um, Shari, is yes. Uh, but I don't think I can let it go without mentioning that Jacinda Ardern has cut her salary for six months then it returns to its uh, same level that it was prior to it with a pay increase. So, um, you know, look, that's... Uh, but I think uh, that we as leaders in Australia need to engender as much sort of shared sense of sacrifice as we possibly can, and if that's part... Of, and if that includes us taking a pay cut for a while, then that's um, entirely acceptable and, and understandable.